shiny. Hey. Hello, Hello. everyone. Welcome to the Metaphysical Art Gallery broadcast. Our featured artist this week is Caitlin Padilla. Caitlin Padilla is best known, I think, for her uh, expression of power and vulnerability using um, the symbol of a nude goddess in space. Among among other things in space. So, yeah. yeah. Um, very much about um, the universal connection of things um, um, at the macro and micro level and kind of the um, uh, elemental forces and Mother Earth and Gaia and a lot of uh, that type of stuff. Space is amazing and fascinating and you know just this idea of beauty and power and entropy and order and the the vastness that that is out there and it's uh always been uh really interesting to me and fascinating and kind of the search for the big the big answers which um I don't know if we'll ever know. They so, elude us know. all, man. They, they elude, elude us, us all. all. Um, I, and... I think, I feel it would be disrespectful not to acknowledge the experience you've been having. <laughs> well, <laughs> thank you. Um, and it was on, if you're tuning in, there was a little synopsis there at the beginning. Um, so I'm coming to you. Um, from the the depths of loss and grief. About a month ago, uh, my husband and partner of 23 years uh, lost his battle with cancer. And um, he was 42. It was three days after his 42nd birthday, which- Oh my God. There we can go do a whole thing about 42 and the answer to life universe, the universe oh and everything. My God. And which is very, very interesting and is, is swirling around all of this and riding the waves. I, I can't think, I mean, there are many, um, I don't want to say tropes, but like um, kind of standard things that people talk about um, when they talk about grief and waves is definitely one of them. And I think that that's a very, apropos um description i think that but it's not like you know like waves it's it's crashing currents and slamming up against rocks and being caught in undertow and finding a moment to that's calm and you can coast but knowing that another wave is coming and kind of just trying to navigate it so that you can not ultimately crash on on, on those those rocky rocky rocks and uh, not come back. So, so you you've been you've been surfing these emotions for a minute now. Yeah, um, you know, trying to survive and. I know that your art making has played a role in that. Yeah, well, um, so right at the beginning of the craziness of the pandemic, uh, my husband was diagnosed with um, chondrosarcoma, which is a very rare type of bone cancer that is cartilage based. So it basically turns whatever bones into cartilage and um, so that was shocking and and it's it's one of those things that that is luck of the draw it's very rare it's not environmental it's not hereditary or genetic um it's it's a lottery winner so um 
last year in june um he had his first operation which was uh something called an internal hemipelvectomy uh, because the most affected area was his uh right um pelvis the the socket and so they went in had this huge surgery took out part of his pelvis and replaced it with metal a, a custom made prosthesis and we spent the next six months um he spent the next six months rehabilitating and learning and um becoming stronger and um by december by this time last year he was walking unassisted he was not even using a cane but working on his limp and then um in the new year um he was working again and he started noticing kind of a decline um, that he he ended up being a little bit more reliant on uh, his cane. And then in April, we found out that it came back. And so they decided to uh, do chemotherapy and then another big surgery um, to the chemo is to shrink it because uh, it had come back and just grown all around the prosthesis. So they wanted to shrink it and have another surgery, um, which ended up, they were going to try to save his leg, but in September, uh, he had to go in and they amputated his leg and took the metal prosthesis. And then um, a month later, he just started declining pretty quickly. And uh, we took him to the hospital and it had come back again. And this time it had, previous to now, it had stayed localized, um, but now it had just started um, metastasizing to other parts of his body. And so they started him on an alternative kind of chemo thing. And uh, it, for the next, mm, not even month. Uh, he went back out and he, we've been going back and forth to Houston, MD Anderson in Houston, which is wonderful. They are amazing. Um, if you are uh, one of the chosen people to have cancer, you, MD Anderson is one of, is the best place to go for it. They were amazing. And um, I believe got it to the point where we had the time that we had and not less time. And so in uh, mid-October, late October, he went out back to MD Anderson and they started him on a different type of medication and uh, decided to do radiation. And within two weeks, um, he just, it, it metastasized everywhere and all of the things that could go wrong kind of did and um it was a race against the clock because we didn't want him to be in houston we wanted he wanted to be home we wanted him home and so on his birthday the the doctors basically told us that this if you want to go home this is the window we're at that point where this is the window where you can get home and be at home um, and you probably want to end up doing home hospice. And so they arranged for medical transport for him to come home. And I, in the next two days, this timeline continued to crunch and um, telescope, microscope in. And I was able to arrange for a medical flight to get him home on Thursday. And he came home and he was here. And I basically reached out to our close family um, saying like he's that tonight <clears throat> is when, if you want to come and see him, then come tonight. And they did and it was beautiful and it was wonderful and we were surrounded by love and 
we were able to see him and we have an eight year old Sophia and she was able to be with him and see him. And he spoke to people. He got an extra burst of, of love and energy. And then at about three 30 in the morning, he passed away. So, um, it's really, really surreal. And one of the reasons why I am um, doing the podcast tonight is because I don't think we as a culture have the best or the, the healthiest relationship to death. And I think that we don't talk about grief and we don't talk about death and we don't talk about the ripple effects that that has for so many lives. And I feel very, very amazingly fortunate and grateful to have an amazing community and for John to have been such, have had such an impact on people and um, to have cultivated this, these amazing people who have been my world um, to get through this. And I know how hard it is for me to go through this. And I cannot even imagine trying to navigate this and do this and stay sane and stuff alone. And my heart and my love and my support goes out to every single person who has had to deal with loss, who has had to deal with pain, whether it be a spouse, a partner, a parent, a brother, a sister, a child, you know, that is, these are some of the worst pain that we as humans go through. And I just, you know, want to acknowledge that I see you. And if you're still kicking it and you have managed to navigate your way to some sort of peace and life and find joy, then fuck, man, you are amazing. So there it is. Yep. To sum up. <laughs> you know what surprised me so much about him? I got to talk to him one time towards the end and he was so happy. He was cracking jokes and living, living life and just, he had such a good spirit. He's such a positive spirit. He was an he amazing, did. amazing human being. And yeah. I am so privileged to have have gotten any time with this person in my life, much less over half of my life. Um, and I, I understand that that is not something that everybody gets. And I am so grateful to have been able to experience that in my life. And for him to, I mean, he very much has always been an integral part of my creative process. And he has always been so amazingly supportive and has allowed me to develop as an artist and feel free to find my voice as an artist and express what my passion is. And having that has been amazing for my artwork. I, I think <laughs> so, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's been, <clears throat> since it's been about two years, um, it's really interesting how being an artist and having this creative process and knowing how important and how much of a big piece of me processing anything in my life has has been through my art and kind of connecting to myself and to others and you said at the beginning you know a, a huge piece of my art is about 
authenticity and connection and vulnerability and and power and like the the juxtaposition or the marriage of vulnerability and power because i think that um being vulnerable and allowing yourself to be authentic and vulnerable is powerful and i think that we create deeper more meaningful create connections when we are our authentic selves because that's that's that true real connection you're not connecting to a facade you're not connecting your facade isn't connecting to another facade and i think in in life <clears throat> it's those connections and that love that we have for each other as humans that give meaning um so going through this and now having the expression of my art and being authentic to what is is happening inside of me has been a really interesting interesting journey and my art has definitely changed <laughs> so <laughs> i don't know what that means for the future i think part of part of being an artist and being authentic to yourself is allowing for those changes to happen even if you are very happy in the style or medium or a mode of expression that you're working in allowing for those transitions and for things to change i think is really important uh, i learned that a while ago when I was doing a series and I was doing a series of ballerinas and I just became really interested and fascinated by um, the tutus and the different fabrics and the tool and all of that stuff. And these are chalk, white chalk drawings on black paper. And um, I remember getting just really involved and really interested and I wanted to experiment with it and I did six of them and I got to the sixth one and I had gotten a really positive response from people and I was like okay this is I enjoy doing this and I'm I'm feeling myself and I can I can produce this and I got to the sixth one and I'm like there was just something inside of me something that was like this is done like this is the end of the series and that's okay. And you need to do something different. And that was, I think one of the first times that I really felt and understood the idea of a, a finite series and how it has like a beginning, middle and end yeah. and, and how that's okay. And so, for the past, I don't know, six or so years, I've really focused on, you know, these goddess figures and anatomical um, drawings and this idea of mind, body, spirit connection and what all of that means. And I worked in with high detail surrealism not photorealism but um there's this one right back here which is anatomically correct and so just you know every single muscle and um all of that and when this was all going down i um just had this very I mean, some of my paintings have taken four months to complete. And mm -hmm. when all of this was happening, I just remember this, this like feeling of, of, you know, like guttural and, and of, of having to get something out. Um, but I found when I sat down to, to do art, it was this very different feeling in this different going from like my heart and head and and hand out onto what I was doing. It just it wasn't 
the idea of sitting there and meticulously doing details just was not at all where where I was. And that's the good stuff, man. Well, it's it's really interesting because I I I definitely I I get lost in details and I just I get into this very meditative mm -hmm. zone and it's very yeah. soothing and and exciting and you know all of these things but it's this like it's fine beautiful in the end but it it, it 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 really can't compete with that the expression of what you are actually feeling in that moment when mm. you splatter whatever you're splattering or slashing or marking yeah there's definitely i mean there the different um categories of art and the different mediums and the different movements and it all taps into different things whether it be different things um philosophically or um energetically emotionally mentally and i mm -hmm. think that that's something that's that's so interesting about the fact that there are so many different styles and and different ways of in, of interpretation and expression and you know it's it's weird how a visual thing can affect you something you see oh, yeah can affect you oh yeah i remember um when i broke down after seeing handprints on the window i had taken care of my ex's boys for a little while um it was a surprise to me i quit my job to do it i didn't know how long i was going to have them three boys and the day they got picked up you know, the day their parents, the happy day, their parents, they got to reunite with their parents and their parents got to come get them. And then the house was empty. And all of a sudden I went from having these three boys, you know, 24 seven to nothing. And I looked over and I was kind of like, wow, it's so quiet. And what am I going to do with myself? And I looked over and I saw their handprints on the window and I just broke down. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and those, it it shows though and it's really interesting that that uh, how old were these boys they were some months one and two see that's just i mean you can't get any more authentic than than those creatures i mean that's yeah. just children are so raw and authentic and and beautiful and they're so willing to create those connections, those, those real connections. And so even though you didn't, you know, they weren't your children and you didn't have them for that long, it, the, the, the emotional connection and that imprint is, yeah. is powerful. Yeah. And, and when, when you have responsibility of those kids, like I didn't carry them and give birth to them. I don't know what that's like, but, they become your whole world. They do. Yeah. They do, in fact. I I agree. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've experienced that with my own child. And um, so yeah, I mean the those visuals do have do have power. And I think that for a lot of really um, expressive work and you know, expressionism and uh, abstract and you know that that more style of art I think that that really is more that raw unfiltered emotional connection I think that that's kind of where a lot of that um, comes out more than than in you know realism or um, you know that that style so I've definitely found myself being um i mean that's what's coming out of me is is this is this raw burst you know kind of in the moment um more so than than before and it's very it's been very interesting and i've i've always believed and and felt like my art doing my art and um has has been very cathartic you know, and again, I process a lot and I get 
a lot out um, through my art. And so carrying that into what's what's happening now, it's just natural that that would continue to be the case, that, that I would have to process and have art and my art practice be a very major piece in that. And so I started, a, I did a series last year um, called Lost and Found. And I had a solo show at um, 718, uh, Central, which is also uh, Curious Toast, and um, I've had my work in a, a couple of other shows, Grief and Gratitude at Tortuga, and um, uh, the Super Funkadelic show at uh, uh, Ghost Wolf this last year, and so having the opportunity to, and, and again, like it's it's the way that things happen and when things happen is when they happen. And so having this trauma, this personal trauma and the going through this, having it overlap and coincide with COVID and this global trauma and this very strange, surreal thing was, was interesting in regards to like the art shows that I was in because there was opportunity to showcase you know my layers of of grief and stuff so uh, i believe i have yeah i i have my lost and found work up on my website do you want to pop it up yeah. there yeah it's called um, spiral designs right yeah actually it's my name i'm i'm currently in the process of oh. rebranding myself caitlinpadilla.com now yeah it's caitlinpadilla.com because right, if I want I to it. be authentic, I have to be me and not be yeah. behind uh, my business. So, um, so yeah, it should there should be a link on the home page, I believe. All right, and you can sign up for my email list, which uh, would be cool. I think I already did. <laughs> I mean, page. just in, in general, the public. So uh, I think if you scroll down or if you go to the, um, like right there is just the juxtaposition when you were up, those two pieces, that's the fire goddess, which I did uh, a few years ago. Yeah, very, then, very representational, very realistic. Yeah ethereal and this is the first piece that i did when um over last summer and the the parts that are that are blue are uh the parts that were replaced with metal and ultimately um uh amputated i was gonna say decapitated but that's not that's not <laughs> right um and so that is much more i think if you go to the menu it might just have the um yeah portfolio and then if you click that lost and found down at the bottom right there oh, that will wow. just show you the the whole series in it and this so looks like quite a juxtaposition this hand reaching out from space very yeah basically you know very representational and mystical and sort of like peaceful yeah and there's and, there's and uh, just like crushing grapes like ah. <laughs> <laughs> yep and um i actually that that self-portrait of me uh i sold before it was dry so oh, it cool. was really it was really interesting to to kind of go through this and i i've done a self-portrait every year for uh, i think like seven seven years and nice. um the there are self-portraits on on the the site from before and so this is if this is the first self-portrait that you're seeing it is very different from my previous self-portraits which are um again a lot more uh rooted in in realism uh and 
So it's been really interesting, you know, this journey. And I called it lost and found because um, I, it's very, it's not that deep because I felt lost and had to find myself. But, um, and I also ended up using, um, because of the, the pandemic and just being at home and going through this, I, I ended up being around a lot of my, um, a lot of my supplies and a lot of my previous artwork. And I had started uh, paintings and, and done like backgrounds or started with that. And I, I ended up finding these pieces and they finally kind of said they wanted to be finished. So um, it's also one of the really interesting things about this process is that I absolutely love the color phthalo blue. It is in every single one of these pieces that are up right there. It's that like, yeah. I, it, just beautiful, vivid blue. And um, at a certain point I realized and it wasn't until uh, one of my friends hung a show, Jen. Lady Jennifer Jen D. D. What's that? Yeah, Lady Jen, Jen D. Mendes, yes. Shout out Lady Jen D. Um, she curated a, a show of mine and it wasn't until then when I saw them all up that I was like, oh, snap, I like phthalo blue. <laughs> so you'd be hard pressed to find uh, a painting of mine that does not have phthalo blue. Um, but I, this last year, started noticing that this rich red just started creeping in and I couldn't get away from it. And it just was so prevalent and so i i just had to start like i had to continue using it and it's been interesting because it's i'm also keeping that phthalo blue and that connection but some like there's just there's more and more red in these pieces and uh, it's hard to tell which red that is on the screen but I the way you're talking about it, I want to say you're talking about alizarin crimson, but you might be talking about cadmium red. It's actually kind of both. It's it's um, it is crim. It, there's there's the crimson and crimson and cadmium are are like wanting to be together, and just in general, I I typically don't. I mix a lot in my work. I typically oh, don't okay. don't use just straight up. Elizabeth Crimson is great because uh, if you're going for transparent red, yeah, like a red that glows red over something else. Then yeah, Elizabeth Crimson is just beautiful to glaze with. Yeah, and and the cad has cadmium the red looks like blood. Yeah, and the cadmium red has has had that that thick depth to it. Yeah. And, and so using both of those, like even with um, phthalo blue, a lot of times um, I, I have some just, you know, straight up phthalo, but I also incorporate, um, uh, what did I just, I just lost it. Um, dark, it's dark, <laughs> blue. <laughs> I just completely forgot what color it was. So um, uh, we have a question from Michael Goodner. He says, do you feel like your color palettes change depending on the different feelings you're trying to express? I think now, yes. I mean, I, I at a certain point, um, kind of had my, my color palette, but at the same time, emotionally, I was really Con consistent in a way about emotionally what I was trying to express and, and convey. But I definitely think that my color palettes change with the mediums that I use, I think a lot of the time, because with um, chalk pastels um, and charcoal, a lot of times I, I do grayscale in that regard. Um, and Prussian, there we go, Prussian blue. Um, and so I definitely think yes to that for like now, because that, that red just coming out and pushing its way through and being that emotion is, is definitely, I'm feeling more red. <laughs> so, 
Um, so yeah, so I did that series um, last year and um, this year, um, oh, actually, hang on. I have one that I don't think is in that collection. Hang on. All right. Oh, yeah. So this um, is, and you can't, I'm going to kind of shine the light on it. It's palette knife. I started using a lot more palette knife. Um, just it's angry and fast and emotional. And um, so this is, uh, was my self portrait from this year. And I did it at closer to the beginning of the year. And this actually was um, one of those cathartic explosive moments because we were waiting to hear from the doctor as to whether or not surgery was going to be an option. And John was in Houston and I was here, so I couldn't even, I mean, through the pandemic, I couldn't be with him in the hospital. So that really sucked also. Um, but so I was waiting until the doctor's appointment and there was a Zoom meeting and I just, I had this crazy, you know, nervous energy and you know, just all of this craziness in my head. And I had probably one of the most stereotypical tortured artist moments of my life. <laughs> and I just like had at a certain point, I had two palette knives and I was just like screaming at the, <laughs> at the canvas. <laughs> and, um, and I did that. And I um, previously had started it uh, a, a few weeks prior and I had started the eyes and I had, I had done the eyes and I was, you know, doing the underpainting of it, which typically I do, um, you know, like a, a, a rough blocking out and then an underpainting. And a lot of times I will actually go through and do a light um, underpainting of the musculature Mm -hmm. the actual structures, uh, what's under there. And then I go over it with like the skin layer and then refine and detail and, and do all of that. And this face had gotten to like the underpainting um, stage and I hadn't gone back to it to, to detail it up. And I had just not been in a detail-y place and um they weren't as, as upset <laughs> the eyes and I just got out. I, I just had a mirror and was looking at myself while I was doing the, the eyes and it was a fast expression. Um, at that point did the, the red palette knife, um, took maybe an hour. And, and so I was just, it was so cathartic though. And I, and I realized when I was finished that there was a definite level of calm that, that I was able to kind of get that out and be present enough to be in that doctor's appointment and prepare myself a little bit more for whatever, um, whatever news was there. And, um, that was early on in the year and it ended up being a positive, uh, appointment. They were like, yeah, we're, we're going to do surgery. It's going to be great. Um, you know, it'll be. And, and so, but I, I very much feel that, the work that I've been able to do and get out has been a lot more um, instantly cathartic or emotionally gratifying 
than um, previous work. My previous work has also been cathartic, but it's been a lot more contemplative and a lot more on on a more esoteric or uh, philosophical yeah. journey. Yeah. And there's and something this, precious about the primal. Really? Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, having this work and having it change so dramatically was, was something that, that I have, I've been thinking about and, and had a struggle with and kind of this idea that, that like, where does my inspiration come from? What does that mean? What does this mean that I am no longer, because this huge chunk of my life is, is, gone and this is such a huge shift and I am you you cannot go through something like this and be the same person that you were and that's a struggle because I liked who I was and (laughs) you know but I can't I can't be that person I'm not that person that person no longer exists because it was in that universe and that universe doesn't exist so what is this universe and what is what who am i now and moving forward and who do i want to be and how do i hold on to the parts of me that i want to hold on to and how do i make space for the new parts of me and you know this is now a part of my story and how do i how do i move through that so I went through this period of time where I, I, and I don't know, maybe other, I'm, I'm imagining other artists go through this, um, where you think like, oh, I'm, that was it. That last painting I did was the best thing I'll ever do. I have lost my, yeah my, my muse and my <laughs> talent. And, um, <clears throat> Boom, you know, that was it. I'm done. That was it. Um, <laughs> But this, so going through that now through all of this, it's even more pronounced and it's even more huge and it's a bigger question. And it's like, well, is, is my ability to do the art that I've done before? Is that, is that gone? Am I, am I just not able to make detailed work or am I choosing to go with this expression and to go with this avenue and this palette and this medium and style and have that since that's what I'm expressing now it's not that um I am no longer able to or I can't technically do the work that I've done before but I, I, and I can't emotionally right now. Um, yeah, yeah. It's a so, different kind of work. It's a different kind of work. It's a different mind space. The strokes have different meanings. They do. They do. And there are two pieces that are not, I don't have, they're not on my website and I don't have them um, that I did this year. One. Um, did you put them on Instagram? I did. That's well, I put one of them. I put one of them on Instagram. The other one um, was uh, it left the house like before I could get pictures of it. But it, it's it's not far. The person who has it, I will see and I will get pictures and prints. It just happened really fast. So, yeah. And on my Instagram, it's a Grim Reaper. And... It was one of the most difficult pieces that I have done uh, because I started out, I've used skulls and anatomical things. And I mean, there's two skulls behind me right now. Um, And I've done that many times. And so I started this piece and I got halfway through it and I didn't want to finish it. And, uh, it was freaking me out and there it is on, on the right. And 
I couldn't figure it out. It was just, it was the skull. And it again is, is much more um, loose and it's also done with a palette knife. And cool. um, I got halfway through it and it was just the skull and I knew what it, had to be and I knew that it was the Grim Reaper but I didn't want to finish it um and so I struggled with finishing it but then it just started staring at me and I needed to finish it so I did and that was really that was really hard uh I did that in June wow and then um the other piece was a, another a self-portrait that I did around Halloween, a little bit before Halloween. And it's um, half of my face is my face and the other half is the skull. And it was just, at a, in a previous time in my life, I would have regarded some of these pieces as unfinished. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just because of my um, adherence to technique and detail and, you know, that uh, kind of perfection in a way. But there is you can you can over you can over protect things. I mean, over perfect, over protect. Um, this is a pretty good Freudian slip there. Yeah, you can overdo it and then turn it into not. Perfect. I feel like there is a difference in vulnerability in art when it comes to the types of strokes you make. If you're making an expressive stroke from emotion, a place of emotion versus drawing what you see. Oh yeah. Drawing, when you're drawing what you see, you're safe. You got all your clothes on. When you start ripping at the canvas, you know, then you're vulnerable. And somebody can say, what is that? That's ugly. You know, like, what is that? And you're like, that's the way I felt. (laughs) And that's, and that's completely valid. Yeah. And so, you know, when, when this all happened most recently, as this timeline can continue to shrink up, um, I, didn't have time for art. I didn't have, cause I was also the main caregiver. Um, and so having an eight year old and through the pandemic, which anyone with children during the pandemic, man, we should all get medals. Um, <laughs> and being a caregiver to my husband and, you know, it just art, my, my art just kind of, was pushed out, unfortunate, unfortunately. Um, And when you get out of practice with anything, it's, it's that getting back into it, that that's the hardest thing. And I think for art, especially like, we have to acknowledge that maybe sometimes getting back into it means you create a couple of shit pieces. (laughs) And that's okay. And that's okay, because you have to shake the cobwebs off, you have to Um, get back your muscle memory, you have to kind of tap into those things again. And it's just really interesting how that changes and, and is shaped differently. So um, this I, I actually created, I, I have a new piece, which this is the kind of unveiling, I posted it on Instagram, I believe. But um, it is wet still on the uh easel but i uh, love light, this piece oh i love it's all piece. weird hang on yeah it's it. okay it's not that bad there that's better yeah yeah this so, piece is awesome man so this again you know expressive palette knife stuff and it's um it's called this little light of mine and goodness, things are falling. So this is my most recent piece coming out of this most recent leg of the journey. 
so I'm I'm interested. Sorry, for my light, my light's falling down. <laughs> um, it's it's going to be interesting to see where this goes. I am. Um, oh, this is Mikey again. Yeah, he says whenever I have created art, I have never been able to consider a piece to be complete. Perhaps that's why I was drawn to photography. What about a piece tells you it is done? Um, <clears throat> I don't. It depends. It really depends. Sometimes, um, there have been those moments where, I mean, I definitely have pieces that that I've thought, ah, oh, it's never done. It's never done. But you have to be done at some point. You just have to. You have to make that decision. You have to learn to walk away because again, you can perfect it into crap. <clears throat> so um, I have a rule that uh, once I sign a piece, it's done. Um, and so there have been, there have definitely been different, different pieces are, are different. Like um, there is definitely a clear stopping point and a finishing point for numerous pieces. Um, and then there are other pieces where there'll be this moment where I I feel that I've like that that I've whatever brushstroke or whatever thing I've done is like the period at the end of a sentence. Yeah. And <clears throat> there could be more to the story, but it gives me pause to kind of think, is this is this the the end is this you know and and it's that first time that i kind of feel that that i have to take a moment and pause and think like is this is it done and then you know i'll i'll either see something and be like no it's not done like i have to i have to finish it or there have been pieces where um that's the case and i'm like okay and you have to learn to be able to walk away. Mm. And so, so that's, that's where I am and that's what I'm doing right now. And, um, I definitely, I was, um, having a hard time deciding whether or not I wanted to do this podcast because getting back out there and getting back into work is fucking hard. And right yeah. now, all I want to do is melt into distraction and oblivion and watch something stupid and, and have my mind turn to mush and not have to be a human right now. Um, but again, some days I can human better than other days. <laughs> and um, I think that this is a very intense difficult thing and i think we need to be able to talk about it and talk about how how grief affects us differently and that's you know another amazing thing about having a great big community is you get to see how people process grief and how different it is for people and how beautiful it is in a lot of ways and being able to be around each other while we're grieving and feel comfortable enough to grieve and mourn with each other and find beauty and peace and heartbreak and anger and together and feel comfortable enough to do that has been amazing. And I just really wanted to be able to put this out there and, and try to make it okay a little bit more to, to talk about grief and talk about how, you know, there's not a right or wrong way to do it. And if you feel that you should be doing something, but you're not feeling that you can do it, that's okay. Um, and it's okay also to 
have conversations and connections and laugh and create and do a podcast and work and not work. And so, I mean, there's just all of this stuff and it's okay to do those things. And you need to be able to process it and work through it in your own way. If, and, and for me, some days that includes sitting in the car and blasting Metallica. So, <laughs> so, um, so there you go. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Caitlin. Thank you. Thank you, Katie. And thank you for allowing me to feel safe and, and comfortable enough to, to share. We will see you again soon, and I'm looking forward to it. Friday, right? Friday, tomorrow? Where are we doing a morning show for the- Yes, oh crap. <laughs> tomorrow. Maybe, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, yes. I, I think that that would be a good idea. So 10.30 okay. tomorrow. We'll, All right. We'll try to do- something else. Maybe I'll be coming to you from my car. With All, right. All right. That sounds great. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Katie. Thank you. Bye. Bye.